Hello everyone. So today we are still three <laughs> online. So we have uh, Radovan, Rachel and myself. And we'll talk yeah. about a subject I have no <laughs> idea about, which is Vitalex. And I'm really looking forward about uh, learning about it and then yeah. about the cluster etiquette. At least I can say a lot. Yeah. I'm a bad <laughs> user. <laughs> mm, interesting. OK. So, hello everybody. Hi. Yeah, hello. So, Git Annex. What are your first thoughts when you hear it? What have you heard about it before? Nothing. So, what I heard about. So, I'm also as same as Anna. I have never used it before, although mm -hmm. I use Git daily since many years. Mm -hmm. And what I heard about it, it's good if I want to track large files. Mm -hmm. And maybe files yeah. I don't want to share. Yeah. So I think the way it works is that it tracks the metadata of the of the files, but then mm -hmm. the date, the files itself can reside outside of the Git repository. Yeah. Okay. So what are the most important things about Git that makes it so popular? Simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Version control. Decentralized. Yeah. Distributed. Yeah. I think that's really it. So decentralized and distributed. Yeah, distributed. Yeah. So there's some other things you might often hear about. So there's Git LFS. So Git LFS is like the centralized version control system. So there's one server where all the data resides. Um, Git Annex is decentralized. And oh, yeah. you can have multiple different places data is stored. What about Git LFS? I mean, you still you still can decide where that central place is, right? Yes. Or is I, there only one central place? I think you can decide where the central place is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but next to you will have data, the same data in different places, or you'll see. So basically, you add remotes <laughs> to the repository, so the data can be distributed among these different remotes, and you can say, send this data to this remote, or send my data to every remote, or so the, one of the important things about it is when you have a huge amount of data, you can't manage it in terms of copying the data or moving it or something like that. You have to say, I want two copies of my data at all times. And you have to rely on the system to deal with that. Or I want to get my data here, figure out where it is and tell me, and then bring it here. Things like that. And that's... Um, why Git Annex can be so good for big research data. So should we get started? Before we get started, maybe yeah. we can remind again that we have this HackMD. Oh, yes. Where you can ask questions and give comments and answer questions. And for those so who should, connected... Should we put it again in the somewhere? Yeah, I don't know how the Twitch chat works, yeah. whether like if you connect, do you see the past of the chat or? Oh, uh, no. Yeah, OK, so we can put it there again and then um, as a reminder for those who joined later, so today we talk about Git Annex, and later if we have time we'll talk about cluster etiquette, like how to, what to do when on a supercomputer, and what to avoid. Avoid. Yes. Okay. It's a chat. Oops. Uh, I just lost a window. Okay. Mm. So here we go. I'll share my screen. So here's my terminal. We start by making a Git repository. Uh, Git, I'll call it Git GA demo. So we start off by running Git init as usual. And then we'll run Git annex init. And let's give this a name. So we'll call it rkdarst computer. Because one of the things with managing data is you have to be able to descriptively identify where things are. So there we go. So I've just told this Git repository that I want to be able to store data along with it. So let's make some data. And can I ask, so what? So git init created uh, dot git, but what did git annex init create? Where did it 
Mm -hmm. So it wrote something into .git or? So if we look at .git, we see an annex here. And this will have some files, but we'll come look at these a little bit more later. Um, so, here we, so you can do a git annex in it uh, many times or only once? So you would, do, yeah, you would do it for each repository or each connection of the repository. Oh, each yeah. connection. Okay. Yeah. OK. So I made a file called file1. So if I git add, it will add it to regular git. So instead, I will git annex uh, add file one. And let's look at this. So we see it's blue here. Actually, I hope that's visible in the font. Yeah. Uh, but we see it's a symbolic link. And it points to this directory here. So to dot git annex objects, some directory hashes, and then this big thing, which is a hash of the contents of the file. So that's basically the primary idea here. So git annex objects, this is where all of our data will be stored. And in git, the only thing that's stored is the symbolic link to it. So let's do git status. And it says there's a new file. OK. So let's git committed and give it our standard message of initial commit. So well, let's look again. We still see the sim link. If we do git log, we see initial commit. If we look at what changed in the log, we see this added a new symbolic link. So yeah. the well, either the one or the two here means it's a, a symbolic link, but it has this link to the directory or to the contents. So just like git, git annex uses a hash of the content in order to store all the data. And that's the key that's distributed all around. OK, so what can we do? Uh, let's cat the file. Uh, objects, it's the only file here. And we see there's the test data inside of it. So like expected. Let's do git annex list. So this lists all of the files vertically and uh, the rows are the different remotes we have. So there's a web and a BitTorrent remote, which are sort of automatically added as a peer-to-peer -peer way to distribute things. But I've never used them, and it has no effect unless you actually enable them or request to store data there. I think in particular, BitTorrent was made to be a way to share data peer-to-peer -peer without having to make your own tunnels or something. But OK, let's see what's next on the list. Any questions so far? So here's the file is if you you still haven't committed the file. So the file is never committed. The file itself, itself. is the data of the file is never stored in mm -hmm. the repository. But the metadata, basically the date it was made and the hash of the contents are in the Git history. So in the git commit, I could say anything I wanted to about it. I could say, yeah, this is going to be a, um, mm, this will be, I made this file on this date, and it's what it means, and so on. So let's go on and do a few more things. So let's make a data2 file. And let's make a large file. So here, this makes a 100 megabyte random file. That's what you call a large file. <laughs> <laughs> but is it uh, meant yeah. to be used for very large files? or Like gigabytes of kinds of things. 
But I, I mean, mean, already a 100 megabyte file, I would, I think that's too large for a normal Git repository as a file. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be like yeah. an image, and this is what right. I said. You would yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how about file 2? Do you want to commit it to regular git? So here, git add file 2, and we list and we see file 2 has not been made the sim link. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, if we get list files, it looks like expected, get annex list, and we see the two annexed files. And these so the git ls files is to list the file? Yeah. Is it your? This is I just. I don't know this ls file. Oh, that's a standard git command that lists all the files git knows about. I just do ls. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> here we can verify that everything's oh, good. added to git. I'm learning. Okay. So these sim links themselves are a really interesting thing. So let's try to edit the file. Notice it is read only. So in Emacs, these 2% size signs mean read only. Uh -huh, yes. So the file is locked. So why is that? So if it's in the annex, that means um, it wants to keep it safe. So before you can edit it, you have to unlock it, which makes another copy. So basically, you can't edit the only copy of data that is annexed. So to me, if I had a research group on a cluster with a lot of data, mm -hmm. I would be happy to use git annex even for this. We make the repository, we collect all of our data from different sources. When a data set comes in, I will annex it all and then make a commit. And then in that commit, I will describe where it came from and who did it and things like that. You know, all of the normal metadata you get in a git commit and then commit it. And now I can be sure that no one will be editing the files unless they're unlocked, and then a change would have to be committed again. Which I think is really useful. So the groups I've been in have always had this large amount of data that just sits there, and you might make, make it um, read only, but that can always be changed. So notice in these symbolic links, it stores it in a read-only directory, and the read-only file inside of there. So some of the more clever programs can't try to change the permissions on the sim link and then do that yeah. <laughs> and then edit it without you knowing. So there is a question on HackMD about the yeah. sim link. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, have, I had a bit of a similar question. So when yeah. you uh, git annex edit the file, mm -hmm. you created a sim link out of it. Yeah. So one question on HackMD, what does that really mean for general use? So what mm. is a sim link? I think let's uh, say about that. Uh, and right. and what, what, what I wanted also to know is that, so just by git annex adding it, mm -hmm. it does something with my file. It moves it out of, it, mo it moves it to a different place, right? Right. And then like, sim links it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a symbolic, does someone else want to explain what a sim link is? Or should I? <laughs> <laughs> That's so, a hard question. So it's a way that the operating system, whenever you try to access this file, file one, it directs you seamlessly to this other file. And on disk here, all it's storing is the reference to here. And as far as any normal program knows, then this is just, when you access this, you get this data. Yeah, it can also be useful. So I use it you now outside of Git and it can be useful if you need the same file in different places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you change it, you don't want you want to change all of them in one, all of them at the same time. And then you can create the file only once and all these different places can link to that one place. Mm -hmm. And then if I change the one, all of them change. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's how I use it too. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. So I just have another question. The file that has been moved to this uh, dot .git, so mm -hmm. it means it, it's not, the real file is not there anymore. Right, yeah. So part of one of the design principles of git annex is that if you 
take find this repository a hundred years from now and git is dead git annex is dead like all these projects aren't installable anymore the information on the file system is enough to recover the data so as long as symbolic links can still be read which basically will be the case if you can access the file system then you'll be able to get your data out of it and pull it out of the annex without any special tools which is a very yeah. important That's philosophy good. yeah yes. and there's even a page that in the git annex instructions that explain why this is the case like all, all the ways they future proof it okay so this is one repository should we make another one and start connecting them yes what do you say i'm really curious about this okay yes. so i'm gonna make a git annex demo 2 by cloning this Okay, so if we look in here, what do we see? So we see file 2, hmm. which has the data within it, but these are broken symbolic links mm -hmm. because this repository doesn't have it yet. So if we look at the size of this repository itself, it only takes up 300 kilobytes, which I guess is the standard size of the git yeah. repo okay so now we will let's see have i prepared this yet so i'm gonna get annex initness and call it other i'm actually not sure if we need to do this but let's do it okay so you would say if you clone this repository. And of course, in the Git repository itself, there's nothing really special here. The repository itself could be shared on GitHub without any of the data within it. Okay, so let's do a git annex list. Hmm, interesting. So we see here, which is this copy of the repository, and then we see origin. And we see that origin has the two different copies. Mm -hmm and here we don't have them. So what if I want to copy here? Which one should I take? Maybe start with file one? That's a small one, yes. Yeah. And if we ls, now we see the sim link is alive now. And if we do git annex list, we see that file one is now in both places. So now is it's a local copy. Yeah, now it's a local copy. So how would this work? Let's say you had all your data on the cluster or whatever your file server is in a Git Annex repository. You can, on your own computer, clone the Git repository and get all of the metadata, but not the large data and then look at it, look at the history, all of that. And when you need something, you do git annex git, and you tell it the file name. Yeah, that's really neat. Yeah. But the, the file is always on the local computer, or can I, could, uh, can I get them remotely? Well. Because here, how do you specify where the file is really physically located. Mm -hmm. yeah. And related question from HackMD is, so mm -hmm. where is the, where can I store it? Can I, yeah, exactly. where can the yeah. connection, location be? Can it be yeah. in the cloud? Where is it typically? Yeah, so the first, well, maybe the first question is where is it for this repository? Well, for this repository, as far as I know, it's always like when a repository, a Git repository has a copy of the file, it's always in that repository itself. That just sort of how it works. I mean, what does it mean to have access to a file if it's not available somewhere? Um, yeah, so like you can't use the file on this computer if it's not put on this computer somewhere. And if it's put on the computer, then it's put in this repository. Is, is a get is a, like a copy. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
But can you somehow store the files okay. in a cloud, or did I answer the question wrong there? Ah, so or that's what we'll get, get to. There? We'll get to there next. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so far, we're doing local remote. So, hmm. No. Okay, so if I do git annex info, I see a list of all of the different remotes that there are. So we see there's mm -hmm. Arcadars computer and other. So these are both regular remotes, which are actual git repositories. What we'll do shortly is special remotes, which are not git repositories. It can be an S3 bucket or a file system, or basically any kind of key value store can be used to actually store the data. And that's pretty neat. OK, but let me see what else was going to be in this section. Ah, yeah. So now I'll do git annex sync. And part of what git annex does is distribute the metadata around. So it assumes that once a file's in, the metadata should be distributed as widely as possible. So when I do this, it has some special way of pushing the um, so to my original demo repository, it synced the skit annex branch. And then it synced master to there. So let's go back to the original repository. Uh, I'm not sure I, I got it. Yeah. I got that one. I mean, so maybe you show it yeah. when you go back to the. Yeah. yeah. So this is something that took me a while to understand, but really, I think the important thing is that when you run git annex sync, then it sends the metadata everywhere. OK, so yeah. in all the, all the mm -hmm. different. Uh, yeah. But how does it know? How does it know? Well, so each repository has a few remotes. Whenever a repository runs sync, it finds the ones it's connected to, and then gets the metadata, and then sends new metadata. To me, it's okay. still sort of a little bit magic. So, um, so does it push like the metadata to all the remotes? Is that what's happening? This yeah. is what I understood. Yeah. Yeah. Is it correct? Yeah. So here we see there's Git. Um, this is the graph of the Git repository. So we see there is the master branch here. And then we see there is the git annex branch. So the git annex branch stores the metadata, and it's been now sent to origin. OK. Yeah. So I think that maybe we should go on. Um, there are also a few like, questions on the HMD. I don't uh, know if you can see that. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what to answer there. <laughs> OK. Uh, so one question was in the, maybe, so in the current example, if someone would clone the repository, the person would get the metadata but could not use the files? Is that right. right, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless they have access to one of the remotes that has the files stored in them. Let's go back to GA demo. Uh, OK, uh, let's list here. If we get annex list, we see so here, this doesn't know of the other remote yet. Uh, if we get annex sync, actually, I don't know if this will work. OK, so it doesn't yet. Um, yeah, because it's not connected. Yeah. How, you cannot know. Right, yeah. So we need to add the. We add the other annex demo as remote now. Yeah. Then you and now we see other. And we see here. So let's say we don't need some files on here anymore. OK, I just dropped file one. It's no longer in this repository. Let's see. Let's, let's drop the large file. Uh, there's an error message. So it could only verify the existence of one out of zero necessary copies. So it won't let us drop it. We can, but it suggests we move it somewhere else 
and we can use force to override the check. So this comes from git, git annex num copies, which is by default one. So it won't let us drop data and lose it completely. Ah, oh, yes, I got it, yes. But that's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's quite secure in that sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's do what it suggests. We git annex move large file somewhere else. List. So now the two files are on other and not here. And I can get them back. So, yeah. So this is the way of moving the data around using actual Git links. So already what we have here, let's say you have you're a group working together and you already access data via SSH or something like that. You can start using Git Annex to move the data around. You can have the working copy on the cluster, another file server for archive, and then you can tell the archive, I want one copy of everything. There's a way you can define what each repository wants. Like you can say the archive wants a copy of everything. So here I'm running git annex sync content. And I think this will get all of the files here. So by default, the sync content means bring all of the files to every repository. But I can override that. But that's getting something to be quite advanced. And let's talk about it at the end instead of now. Let's go to something cooler, which is the special remotes. And this is where we get to the cloud storage and things like that. Any questions so far? Let's see. So there is a question about compatibility layer, Git LFS and Git Annex. Yeah. And the other question, which maybe we should also do now. So, mm -hmm. and again, coming back to the actual files. So the one that I'm highlighting now. So to upload the actual files, mm -hmm. would we use the normal Git add Git commit? In my understanding, no, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we never want to actually track these with normal git right yeah, yeah. Oh, so how are they really stored how does that really work but maybe you will come to come to that because it's still not completely clear to me well but is it what you ex is it i thought you explained it at the very beginning with the yeah. dot git yeah so when i move a file from place to place it's shuffling stuff around inside of the objects directory here somehow magically behind the scenes and making the sim links work um, but is it really tracking changes in the real sense of changes? If so, you change a, yeah. like a binary, an image. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we can try that. So git. So I'm going to git annex unlock file one. And let's edit file one. New line. And then I do git status type changed file one. So it turned from a link to this. So I think if I git add file one, it will complain. Hmm, didn't complain. Oh, it doesn't complain. Um, so you can change it from a, a git annex to a... So I think if I do git commit, it will make it annexed again. Because I had, ah. I had unlocked the file before. So let's, let's see, try. git commit. And look, there it's a sim link again. So if I do git log, then I see. Yeah, it is back to a... initial commit, large file, that. So all of the syncing and stuff happens in the git annex branch. And this is only tracking mm -hmm. the yeah. changes in the files themselves. If I do, so we work as usual, uh, actually. Yeah, afterwards. pretty yeah. much. If we look at the Git Annex branch, we see well a bunch of things that says update. This is sort of just transparently handling all of the metadata about what is where. Okay, but let's go to a special remote. So the weakness here is that anywhere you put data has to have a Git repository, and you have to have shell access to it. Like this isn't working for GitHub. 
So let's use what we call the directory special remote. Mm. Let's see, where did I do this? Here we did. So let's make a new directory. So this is file storage. And why are we using file storage? Well, it doesn't really make sense to put another copy of the files on the same computer, but this will show what the key value store is like. And then you can imagine that this is being pushed to S3 or, well, any other kind of cloud service, Google Drive, whatever. Okay. Uh, that's great because I think this will clarify it for me because that, that's what was not yeah. clear to me yeah. until now. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So there is init remote. So this is not named very well. Init remote means init a special remote, which is not actually a Git repository. And this will be called directory storage type equals directory. So let's say it's shared encryption. So that means that it will create an encryption key, store it inside of this Git repository, and then push the metadata. And then whenever, no, when the data is put in the remote, it will be encrypted. So encryption equals shared. Um, file storage. Okay. So here, if this is a real remote, what do you do mm. instead of the folder? So we'll demonstrate connecting to S3 next if there's oh, yeah, time. Okay. Awesome. But you would basically say, let's see, the options you use are host equals a3s.v, bucket equals whatever, protocol mm -hmm, a yeah. So there's basically using these options, you can pass whatever you need to it in order to um, set it up. Okay, so git annex list. So now we see the directory storage. So should we move the large file to there? Yes. Large file to the directory storage. So this took a little bit longer because it's encrypting it. Uh, but uh, encryption is because you have chosen to en encrypt. Right, yeah. So if we look at the file storage, we see there is a temp and this thing here. So it's also encrypting the file names of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, in 7 through 3, we see another thing. So it's like a hashed or uh, using file names to hash the storage and drill down some so that one directory doesn't get too many different file names. And here we see, so something says gpghmac shell one. Let's look inside that directory. And it's the same thing. And let's look at the file with less. And it says it's a binary file. And we see something that Ah, this was the large file, so of course it looks random. Let's copy the small file to it. Uh, and instead of that, we'll look at 324. Look at this file. So we see it's small, but definitely encrypted compared to what we had here. Yeah. So where's the encryption key stored? Let's go look at the git annex metadata. So show git annex. So this is the contents of the git annex branch. So we see these somehow store the metadata of the files, and then there's remote.log. If we look at remote.log, we see this thing here, which is name, directory storage, type equals directory, mm -hmm. timestamp of when it was updated. And this is probably the cipher key. Yeah. 
So this may not be what everyone wants, but this so basically being able to clone the Git repository makes it able to get the um, get the data from the other remote. So for some use cases, this is useful. So it's easy to control access to a small Git repository. It's hard to control access to large data, which may need to be stored on some other specialized service. And here, this turns the hard problem into the easy problem. There's other ways of doing the encryption, like um, using GPU G keys. So instead, it encrypts the cipher with the key, with your personal key, and then stores it in the uh, remote log. So you need both the Git repository and your own personal key in order to access it. OK. So how does this store stuff in cloud and things like that? Well, if we look here, it's basically like this. So this becomes a key value storage, and then it puts whatever it needs into S3 with these kinds of names, or in Google Drive, or in a directory in the case here. There's a way you can make special remotes by making an external script, which will it's a, it's a protocol, so you can write any kind of um, special remote you would like. So when you're first trying to use the previous CSC storage system, I wrote something called git annex remote irods, um, which would store it in an irods remote, which in the end we never used because it got replaced with alas, but that's the basic idea here. OK, so that's questions. That came in was, uh, I don't know if you ever tried Git Annex Web, mm. so that then mm. you can have a web interface to right. manage remotes and synchronization. You could have a look at it in real time. Yeah. Then a question that I had was that, so let's imagine that your research mm -hmm. group is managing data with Git Annex, mm -hmm. and the data is stored on S3, wherever. Mm -hmm. And now I come in, a new group member. Mm -hmm. So I would have to get access to the Git repository. I clone mm -hmm. the Git repository, and yeah. then I also need to get access to the uh, to the storage. Mm -hmm. And then what do I do? So then you would, well, you would clone the Git repository, and then to your personal workspace, and then you would. Presumably, you would know what file you want to work on. So your group would say, "Okay, you need these files." So you would do git annex git, and then it would know from the metadata that it should be stored in a special remote with this host name and this location. So you can also embed the S3 token inside of the repository metadata. So it would have everything you need in order to access it all. But um, Perhaps you want someone to have to get a separate key to do that. It, it depends on the data, I guess. Maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Do you want to try the S3 thing quickly? Or yes. are we? OK, let's do it. So the hardest part, so OK, now I'm going to try to use this in order to store data into S3 in the CSC service called ALAS. CSC is the Finnish National um, E Infrastructure and Computing Center. So they have an S3 storage, which is their recommended place to use data. The problem is, in order to use this, your idea is, OK, I'm copying this data here. I'm getting this data to this directory. But how do you track versions of things? How do you know what's where? How do you not forget something? So this is where I think Git Annex can be useful. And the hardest part of setting this up was to figure out just how ALAS worked. They provided these scripts, and it says, run this, and then you can access it. But it doesn't say, here's the S3 host name, and here's how you get the token. Mm. So I did this about two hours ago. Let's hope it still works. Uh, so it made this file. Actually, I had to modify it a little bit. And then uh, this puts the tokens in there. 
git annex init remote type equals s3. I'll do encryption equals shared because there's really no reason not to. Host equals a3s.v. Bucket equals ga demo two because I made ga demo one earlier today. And then I realized I had to do these two things here. And let's hope okay. this works. Why is it pulled? So it get annex said it would be able to find the right port if I specified the protocol, but somehow okay. it didn't. So I don't know. And let's not forget to tell it the name. Atlas. Oh yeah. Okay. But otherwise it's quite simple. Yeah, I mean. Well, it looks simple once you have the S3 credentials, but getting those S3 credentials was quite a challenge. Okay. No, but on a normal Amazon, it will, it's traceforward to get it. Yeah. Mm. And also afterwards, it would be nice if you can share this, how to how to do that. So that's a question on HackMD. Right. Uh, how to set this up with Alas, because mm -hmm. I think many will be interested in that. Yeah, I will do that. Okay. So now I can get annex well i wonder if this works no i guess uh copy mm, uh, get annex copy the current directory to alas so it's encrypting Okay, and now it's yeah. uploading. I guess it will take a little bit of time. And now there it is. So you may think it's a little bit of a problem that the file name in Alas won't match the file name that you're using on disk. So just looking at Alas doesn't give you enough to access things. Git Annex has in the last few years developed something called import tree and export tree which means that you can export everything with the real file names that you see here. So basically you're exporting it. Um, how would you call it? Like mm, you're exporting it, it with real file names. The problem okay, but is- that's an option you said before you do this copy. Right, yeah, now it's too yeah. late to do that. There, yeah. there would be a different special remote. So of course I could add another ALA special remote with a different bucket that uses export tree to save the file names. There's an option within this to tell it to make the S3 bucket public. And then I can tell in git annex that this is the public URL of the bucket. So anyone by cloning the repository will be able to do the git annex git without getting their own S3 token, which might That's be useful nice for some use cases. I you was could, thinking exactly yeah. to use it this way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but that's really nice. Yeah. You could even have several remotes, one for your internal yeah. group work, which is just the like everything, and one for the data you want to make public, and then you put it there. OK. So here I had opened the CSC web interface uh, with different, this is a test project we have. GA demo two. So we see there's some file called annex UUID. So it'll be able to know what the bucket is and it has the GPG encrypted stuff here. It can also do chunking of the files. If the file is too large, it will break it into a hundred or 50 or one or however many megabyte chunks you want. So let's see. Um, yeah, and that's basically what I wanted to talk about. Oh, it's done. Let's refresh. So here we see there's two files, 100 megabytes and 89 megabytes. So it's there with a file name that can't be understood by the remote and content which can't be understood by the remote. Let's do a metadata test. Uh, let's see how this works. I've never actually used this. Metadata path set. Uh, 
set. So now I've set the owner of something to that. So now whenever this is being cloned around, you can say record who's managing each file or things like that. When it was generated, the experimental parameters, all that kind of stuff. That's nice for the provenance in here. Yeah. And I think I've even seen some ways that whenever you add a file, it will, um, like you can automatically generate some metadata based on a script when you add things. But this is like beyond what I've done. Oh yeah, yes. Okay, yeah. so you could keep track of, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, some additional metadata with the yeah. yeah. Nice. It's really nice. Do we have anything like that in Norway uh, that we can connect to and hook up? What just happened? I, I'm using wow. the real Amazon. <laughs> yeah. But I with just... my own money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I just ran git annex map, which is something I saw, and it made this little link that shows what knows what, which is interesting. Oh, nice. Yes. So we have a couple of more questions okay. on D. Uh, one of... Yeah. So the question was about encryption. Mm -hmm. So if the repository is public, mm -hmm. then having the tokens keys in the metadata would be problematic. And I think this is something that we have also been talking about on Zurich chat just before the stream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and maybe related to it. Um, so our uh, encryption, is this encryption a requirement or is this an optional thing? Okay. Encryption is optional. Mm -hmm. um, it can be none, a shared, or public key. I think there's something called hybrid, but I don't remember what that does. Um, okay, what other questions? The other question was, mm -hmm. does it use S3 CMD in the background or Swift? I don't know uh -huh. the answer. So I think S3 is built in, so it might use a Haskell library for S3 stuff. Um, let me show you something. So here's a thing called git annex remote r clone. If I look at this, we see it's a large program. And well, actually, I don't know what any of this means, but I can somehow, OK, I have to look it up now. So let's go to the Git Annex web page, special remotes. So here's all the different options it has. Well. Mm. Let's see. And while we look, also a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. So in this case, only people who have access to Alas bucket would be able to access the data. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yes. I mean, there's kind of these multiple different things going on. There's where's the encryption key stored? Who has access to the bucket? Like if you want other people to access the data and you have a shared encryption key, then that's not really a good idea. But presumably you would also, well, only copy the data to a public remote that you wanted someone to be able to get. So like, there's basically so many different options for how you can design these things. OK, but we scroll down, and there's these um, other things. So where's our clone? Our clone special remote. So it accesses all of these different cloud services using the script that I just showed you. Um, and let's see how we would set it up. Yeah, I see we on cloud is supported. Yeah. So we get, have on cloud in Norway. Hmm. Well, there you go. Uh, you can also tell how trusted remotes are. So you can say, Alas is a trusted remote, which means that Git trusts that the data is actually there before dropping it. Or you can say something is untrusted, which means that you expect the remote might drop the data at every time, at, at any time. So it can't count towards the minimum number of copies you want to hold. 
Okay, so here's how we would set up a special remote, get annex init remote, the name type equals external, external type equals our clone, which means it will find this get annex remote our clone, and then whatever other parameters you may want for it. Okay. So before we started, I said there was about 80% chance, chance that you thought this would be, what would I say? Mm, I give, yeah, I give it an 80% chance that you think this is one of the coolest things ever. So what do you think? I want to try it, honestly, <laughs> on a real project. Yeah. So one of my recommendations is ask someone for help. Maybe me, maybe someone else, because there's a lot of documentation on it. And while it does seem to be rather complete, it needs, well, it took me a long time to get to where I was now. Maybe now, though, with this introduction, it will be a lot easier for you to do things. Yeah, also maybe like a blog post write-up or something mm -hmm. just to, would be, I think, super useful. Yeah. I think if I try it on a real project, I can write a blog post. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think you can write now. Mm -hmm. Or if someone else would use it on a real project, I think it could be very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so I think this really solves the problem. Uh, actually, it was at the Research Data Alliance meeting in Helsinki over the, no, in the spring, no, last year. So I was at this presentation that talked about the difficulty of getting people to use cloud services or these kind of e-infrastructure services. So they said that once you get to the point of here's an object storage, this is the modern way of doing things. Use this for your research. Well. You basically have people that need to write a data, like, what's the word? Data management, data replication layer in order to really use that efficiently. And only big projects do that. So Git Annex sort of is that data replication layer. So it replicates the data, it remembers what's where, it pushes pools, it prevents you from deleting things you don't want. and. That's what we really need. Who is behind this? Is it like people mm. working on the green time or is somebody really funding it? So it's made by a dev Debian developer called Joey Hess. Um, it's maybe 10-ish years old, something like that. And it's mostly him for the most part. There have been some crowdfund crowdfunding sources to get, um, actually it was, well, crowdfunding in order to fund development, but also it's been a part of some bit major grants, like this data lab project that Enrico was linking to. So that was a collaboration between research groups and Joey to develop a service using Git Annex that would be able to replicate data all over the world like this. Mm -hmm. So it has some support, but really, I think it could use more. Yeah, yeah right. it looks quite. Uh, I mean, simple once yeah. you have all the procedure. Right. Yeah. To put in place, mm -hmm. uh, I really would like to. I will try. Yeah. To, to use it on a real project to yeah. see if this is as simple as you showed. Yeah. Two more questions, if we have mm -hmm. time. One is, uh, what is the record, the largest file or largest amount of files we have ever tracked with Git Annex? Hmm. And the other question is, so if if somebody already has a lot of data in uh, Alas bucket or um, somewhere mm -hmm. on Amazon, can you link it with the repository? Hmm. How would you start to start using Git Annex on something existing? That's a good question. So for the first one, when I was going to use this for some data I had, someone asked, well, does Git track that many files well? And According to the Git Annex docs, the limit with number of files is basically the limits of when Git starts slowing down. Um, 
for how large a file can be, I don't really know of what the limit would be. Actually, let's see. I think I've even... There's a scalability there section. There is a limit because it doesn't really track. I mean, yeah. if, if you put things on a yeah. bucket, it's usually quite large. And here yeah. it doesn't track much. For the, for the size, probably size limited by the storage of where that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But also, I mean, that's what I will try. We have yeah. quite not very large in that case. Yeah. But also because Git Annex can do chunking in the special remotes. So if the file limit, size limit is one gigabyte or something, you can tell it to chunk all the files to 500 megabytes and then incrementally up and download them in that size chunks. So you can actually go from large files locally mm -hmm. to small yeah. files stored somewhere else. So you would even improve performance in that case. Yeah. So it says, arbitrarily large files can be managed. Mm -hmm. Memory usage should be constant, except for memory links. Many files can be managed. And I did a test where I was making Git repositories with the order of millions of files in it and Git annexing oh, yeah. them. And I just couldn't make it stop working really well. Like it, it worked, it seemed to be mainly limited by disk access speed. So, okay. And um, yeah. we have time to comment on that question. So how do you start? How would you start if you already have data somewhere? Hmm, okay. Do you mind if I try to do something live? No. No. Uh... Okay, so I want to look at this import tree thing. So we get to the problem of not knowing where to click and there's no contents here. Let's see, internals. No. I think I can already announce in the meantime that probably we will not have time <laughs> for the cluster etiquette, right? Yeah, probably not. Which I'm really sorry, but then we will do it next time. It's something I really want to talk about. Yes. Hmm. Does git annex import do it? So here, importing from a special remote. Importing from a special remote first downloads or hashes all oh, of the yeah. new content from it, mm -hmm. and then constructs a git commit that reflects the files that have changed since the last time it was looked at. Merging that commit into your repository will update to reflect changes in the special remote. So to me, this implies that it is possible, but we're sort of out of time, so it depends on how much you want to see me try to do things. but. We can put, it. try it uh, and put it in the blog post if we need. Yeah, I think this write-up would be really, really useful. We really like a walkthrough of all the, all the all the steps. Oh. And thanks also so much for lots of questions today, Anna Candy. That was really great. Oh, three. I wonder if this will work. It's directory. Oh, we have to say in encryption equals none. So the encryption options are none, shared, hybrid, public key, or shared public key. Okay, there it worked. Oh yeah, okay, nice. So how does git annex import one work? Hmm. Okay, back to drawing board. But maybe not everything can work with import tree. I guess it depends on if the special remote can be listed because even being able to list the files in a special remote isn't one of the requirements of using this. 
to import from get next import master from my remote. Let's see. Oh, uh, what's the remote name? Oops. Okay, I called that wrong. Uh, tree. Let's call it tree. Yeah, there. That's funny. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Okay, that failed. From what did it say here? Invalid option for me. Well, it looks like I did exactly what it says there. Maybe something is out of date. Uh, non exhaustive list, so it would work with the S3 remote. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can read the help text. What? Git annex. So maybe I can mention a little bit unrelated question that came up on HackMD just while we mm -hmm. look for the solution here. And that is, I think it's a great question. And that is, do we have recommendations for good scientific software podcasts mm. or Python podcast? Mm. Oh yeah, RSC stories, how could I forget? Yes. Oh yes, that's why, very good. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, we mentioned it a couple of episodes ago. Yeah, that's a really nice one. I, I don't know the other one, talk Python to me. I, I need to check that out. Yeah, I uh, need to check it out. It looks nice. I wonder if it could be that. Oh, nice. Oh, this is not the right version. Not... I had just updated this. I updated this right before um, the show. Oh. Oh, yes. It's doing something. List three. Hmm. So it's only available in your version, or you had a pretty uh, old one before. Hmm. Well, should I give up or keep going? I mean, so otherwise we can, we can try offline. Yeah, uh, maybe we can summarize a bit mm. and thanks again for lots of questions on that it was really a pleasure yeah um, okay sorry we didn't manage to talk about uh, cluster etiquette but then like you know tv series we leave in a cliffhanger so next time <laughs> uh, next time yeah. i think maybe we can do a whole session on really cluster mm -hmm. etiquette because there is a lot to talk about yeah yeah and okay this is really cool and we are waiting for the blog post. And yeah. <laughs> thank, thanks, everybody. Thanks okay. Thanks yeah. Everyone. Thanks for um, guiding me through this. OK. So do we stop now or any more questions? I guess we basically thanks answered for showing everything. us. It's, it's very yeah. cool, actually. OK. So I'll stop the recording.